and good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning, Bethany, both here in the sanctuary and also online. I'm glad that you're with us. It's good to be with you. I'm not here as frequently as I once was. I've been away teaching in some other places, but it's really good to be home and uh, consider a very important topic this morning. I want to invite you to pray with me, and then we'll begin. Father, we'd like to commit these moments to you because we're mindful that uh, we're living through uh, tumultuous times. Some would say this is one of those seasons that comes along once every 500 years, and uh, on the far side of it, there's profound changes. Uh, We would just collectively and individually express our desire to live faithfully in the midst of storms in order that we might be people of peace in the midst of turmoil and hope in the midst of despair and confidence in the midst of fear. Fill us and teach us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm going to give you at the very outset here this morning the sermon in like 90 seconds because I know what happens. You get bored, you fall asleep, you, take, you look at your phones, and I want to make sure you get the main gig this morning and then we'll unpack it for those who are geeking, geeking out enough to follow the whole way. But, but this is a story about healing, and I'm just going to note here that at the outset, uh, it's, a, it's a story about both receiving healing and then being filled with the capacity to become a healer, right? And it's, just know this, it is God's desire, your wholeness. Your wholeness is God's desire. Uh, this is not name it and claim it, like no one should ever have, you know, cancer or anything like that. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying, and the scriptures are saying what a mentor of mine said, that when we have life in Christ, a substantial healing ensues. And it's, yes, it's physical, but it's, but it's more than physical. It's also healing from fear and shame and bitterness and hidden addictions and, and, and greed and all forms of idolatry. And understand, I don't have time to get into it this morning, but those things affect your body as well. And, and so healing of the soul brings healing of the body, and this is a story about healing, right? So it's a story about healing, but it's also most significantly, in one sense, it's a story about power. And there are two kinds of power in the world. There's secular power and divine power. And if you are, here's the thesis, if you're to receive healing and then become a healer, watch this, you must live in the stream of divine power. If you choose and said secular, secular power, I'll unpack that. But if you choose that, you're cut off from receiving healing and you're cut off from being a healer. So, so you got to live in the stream of divine power. And living in the stream of divine power is very difficult. That's why we're here. <laughs> so that we can kind of learn what it means to walk in the stream of divine power. So that's, that's basically uh, where we're going to go. Christ followers, as we'll see, have a long history of responding differently to an opportunity to align with human power instead of divine power by compromising convictions. This story shows us how to navigate those waters by walking us through three events. What we see in this story this morning is divine power displayed, first of all, and then an inquisition engaged, and then uh, a confident obedience is declared. As so we're going to look at those three things, beginning with divine power displayed. Sarah's already read for us the story of Acts 4, Oh, excuse me, of Acts 3, we're going to say mostly Acts 4 because you now you know the story, right? So here's what had happened in Acts, in Acts 3. There's a man, and he had developed a workaround for the reality that he could not be a laborer in any way because he was afflicted, he was paralyzed, so he couldn't move, so he couldn't contribute to society. So um, he had a community of people who would carry him up to the entrance of the steps of the temple, and there, as people come into the worship, he would uh, ask for gifts as a means of sustenance. And so people would give money, and that's fine. And then you heard the story. They asked Peter. He didn't have any money, but he gives them something better. He gives them healing, and it's very powerful. And then at the end of the story, we see, at the end of Acts 4, we see the foundational reality that drove Peter and his disciples. Because in chapter 3, this is what it says. So Peter extended his hand to the guy... And then he grabbed me and says, stand up and walk, right? At the end of chapter 4, Peter offers a prayer, and this is what he prays. Grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. In other words, Peter understands this. When I'm extending my hand, it's not me extending my hand. It's Christ, because Christ lives in me, and because Christ lives in me, I am the presence of Christ. Now, 
I can't even, I could spend hours talking to you right here about how significant this is and how hard it is for us to actually believe this. This sense of union with Christ is foundational to any meaningful notion of what it means to be a Christ follower. Like I'm united with Christ. In Eastern Orthodoxy, in fact, the, the, like we talk about making disciples, in Eastern Orthodoxy, discipleship, the word used for discipleship is this, divinization. In other words, you becoming more and more and more like God. And as evangelicals, we're like this, no, 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 that can't be. Like, here's what we get, total depravity, original sin, worm theology, you're hopeless, you know, the best you could ever hope for is, you know, a ticket to heaven so that when Jesus, you know, when God looks at you, he doesn't really see you and all your junk, he sees Christ, and because he sees Christ, somehow God is tricked by that, and he lets you in heaven anyway, in spite of the fact that you're hopeless, right? That's kind of evangelical theology in a nutshell, and I'm oversimplifying and exaggerating and all that stuff, forgive me, but here we go. Uh, Whereas in the East, like the starting point is this. You are filled to all the fullness of God, Ephesians chapter 3. Like you're filled with the life of God. And, 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 and so in that, it means, like if I believe that I'm filled with the fullness of God, and that the reason God initiated that fullness in Christ is so that I, I could now be filled, and, and being filled, I'd be healed, but now I healed, I'd then become a source of healing, even as Peter was in this moment, right? I would be able to bless other people. And that's, of course, what Jesus said. He didn't say, hey, I'm the, I'm the light of the world, so go out and try hard to imitate me. Go learn my stuff and try to obey me. Make sure you avoid all your yucky sins. He said, I'm the light of the world, and then... Short ministry, very quickly, then what does he say? Matthew chapter 5. I'm the light of the world. And then he says this, you are the light of the world. Wait a minute, Jesus, I thought you were the light of the world. Well, I am the light of the world. Now, I'm, you don't know this yet, but I'm already leaving. And when I leave, th watch this, the same light, Christ, is now in you. You are the light of the world. And, and, and so, th living out from this union starts with believing in this union. This is divine power. This is your source of divine power. I must believe that I am filled with the fullness of God, that Christ lives in me. And, and this union was, according to Paul in Colossians 1, hidden from previous generations. In other words, in, in the garden, right, Adam and Eve, and when, whoever wrote those first five books, many think Moses, it was God with us. And so here's, you know, here's me, here's God, and God's like my, my coach, or like, my private tutor. And so I'm learning how to be godly by hanging out with this one, God with me. And you go through the whole Old Testament and there's this sense of if I have a need, I come to the filling station who is divinity and I get what I need and then I go back out. And in its worst perversion, that's what Sunday becomes for some of us, right? Uh, like the week is ridiculous. Traffic, work metrics, a boss I can't stand. Kids, you know, they're out of the room now, so I can say that. Kids, you know, challenge, challenge, challenge. Oh, thank goodness I can come on Sunday and fill my tank. I got news for you, your tank was never empty. You just forgot the resource you have in Christ. Because it says in Colossians 1, the mystery was hidden from previous generations. Previously, God was a tank. Previously, God was a coach. But now the mystery hidden from previous generations, Colossians 1 is, the, here's the mystery. Christ in you, that's the hope of glory. You have everything you need to live the life for which you created. But I'm gonna just tell you this, knowing this intellectually is not enough. It has to, it, this has to become an existential reality, like an experience. Not left brain only, but right brain, right? So that you now live a life filled with the fullness of God. That's the power that heals people. That's the power that points people to the source of Christ's life. That's the power that is uh, only available because it's ultimately submitted to the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that power is not dependent on a degree or an economic station in life or gender. That power doesn't need a 501c3 to exist 
or a Christian president, or the Ten Commandments in every school, or a Republican, or a Democrat, or tax exempt status for churches, or even church buildings to be displayed. You don't need any of that for that power. And so when we think that that's the stuff we need to get our job done, we're kidding ourselves. You may have that stuff, fine. Steward it, use it, but don't ever get addicted to it because that's not your source of power. Not, it's not about your money, not your degree, not your sphere of influence. You don't need TikTok to have a ministry <laughs> or a business or anything. You don't. The power of the gospel is completely unmoored from the power structures of this world. Hear me, God doesn't care. Historically, the church's most powerful transformative moments, in, in fact, have happened when they move from the margins rather than the center. In other words, when... Uh, um, John Wycliffe translated the Bible into, into English. He was persecuted by the religious authorities. He was on the margins. He changed the world. Martin Luther on the margins changed the world. Hildegard of Bingen, uh, like this feminist eco-nun in the 11th century, she changed the world from the margins because she spoke truth to power uh, and it, it cost her, you know, a position and influence, but she changed the world. Underground Railroad, from the margins. MLK, voting rights, from the margins. Here are people without any human power or platform or media influence or political favor, they're changing the world. All the stuff we think we need, they don't have. What do we need? We need one thing. The divine power of the Holy Spirit in union with God. And in fact, I would, I would go so far as to say that's not just what we need. In a very real sense, that's all we need. Because if I have that... I have everything I need to fulfill the calling that God has given me. But if I don't have that and I have everything else, I really don't have anything. So I would believe, and I don't have time to prove it to you right now, but I would believe that if you're in Christ, you, you are filled with the fullness of God right now, right here. And you're like, oh, no, that's not me. You don't know my sins. You don't know the argument I had this morning. You don't know my little hidden addictions, whatever, whatever. And I go, okay, I get that. But here's the problem. Like, that power is not actuated into our experience without us believing it. And we don't believe it by nodding our heads. We believe it by, by continually saturating ourselves with that reality. It says in Romans 12, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, but the renewing of our mind is not just taking notes because your mind is not just intellect, it's affect. Do you know what I mean? It's emotion. It's left brain, it's right brain. It's, it's facts, it's neural pathways. And I need new neural pathways to look at my friend over here, Rich, who's a neurosurgeon of some sort. Like, <laughs> I, like I need those pathways rebuilt how does that happen? Well, for me, it happens in meditation. And uh, again, with the caveat here that every technique is just a technique. No technique is a secret sauce. The goal isn't to practice a technique. The goal is to make this real. How do I make it real? Well, I'll tell you what. When I get up in the morning, um, I sing a song in the shower. And it's a song that I made up. And, and I sing it every morning at least five times. It's a cold shower, but that's a different sermon. And I'm going to sing it now only because I want you to know the words and know that I'm vulnerable. That's the only reason. <laughs> Not because I want a job singing. Come, Holy Spirit, heal me. Come, Holy Spirit, free me. Come, Holy Spirit, guide me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me. da 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 Three, four, five, six. Then I'm really cold. Seven. Then I'm warm. Different story. Eight, nine. I need, I need those realities. And, and by the end of the shower, I'm like this. Oh, yeah, I am being healed. I am being freed. I am, I, I am being, I, I'm filled. I'm filled. That and listening prayer, which is allowing God to say things to me and believing that if, as I've asked to hear from God, what comes to me is from God. So there's just recently on a dog walk, uh, this phrase just kept coming to me. Richard, uh, your losses in life have given you the gift of greater intimacy with me. Man, I carry that with me. Do you see? 
We, we live in this, we swim in this ocean of the reality of our, of our union with God, and then it becomes real in our experience. But if you wait for the experience to believe it, you'll never have the experience. You begin to, believe, you begin to practice based on the faith of that which is not yet seen. And then you have this power. And this kind of spirit living requires not only a vision for the union and a belief in the union, it requires a, a surrender then to the wind of the spirit so that if we pray for guidance, then we believe that God is guiding us. And so when things happen on, on a given day, not according to our plan, we're like, okay, God, you're, you're still in control. So you know, get on a plane, I flew to the Midwest recently for a thing, and I'm not one given to uh, like... Um, preemptively engaging in conversation with my seatmate. That's not my style. Some of you are. It's fine. You're good. You're extroverts. I have, a, like I have a book and I have a movie list, you know, and hopefully a glass of wine as well, and then uh, I'll be fine. And then this, this person begins to engage, and pretty soon we're talking about the difference between Eastern Orthodoxy and Evangelical Christianity and what happened to Evangelical Christianity in this political environment and why have my kids left the faith and why am I thinking about leaving the faith and how do I know what's real and how do I know what's true? Uh, and and th- I just believe that if I prayed for God to guide me and I ended up in, you know, C- 7C, God guided me. But for that kind of life, we need to surrender. And what that means is uh, we're not, like it's not preemptive for us to say, I must have whatever. No, you don't need it. Russell Moore uh, was the previous leader of the Southern Baptist Ethics Arm, and he recently wrote a book entitled Losing Our Religion, which I'm reading now. And uh, I'll get into why he needed to leave the Southern Baptist denomination in a minute, but for now, I want you to know that when he writes about leaving his denomination, it was costly to leave. I quote him now. I wasn't losing my faith, but I was losing my religion. The altar call they were issuing had me walking in the opposite way, right out the back doors, into a world I'd never known before. On the other side of that reverse altar call, I started to question everything. Was that uh, all it was? Had it all been a lie? That began a period of not just questioning all my assumptions, but also of simultaneously grieving my lost religious home, my burdened conscience, recognizing complicity and participating for so long in something that now seemed both inane and predatory, I couldn't help but wonder if the plot twist to the story of American conservative Christianity was that we thought what we thought was the Shire was Mordor all along. And if you don't know Lord of the Rings, then I'll pray for you anyway, but talk to somebody... (laughs) Someone out here will explain that that word picture to you. I pretend that all of this is past me, but it lingers. I still have tinnitus, stress-induced. I'm still waiting for one night's sleep without nightmares of my conflict within the denomination. What needs to be surrendered if I'm going to live in this power of the Spirit is any kind of addiction to my position and my influence Because if that is the main thing, God is no longer the main thing. And I know people who've lost, like they shoot the moon and they speak truth to power and then they have no power. They had it the day before and then they don't have any anymore. I know many people in that boat. Hans Jägerstadter, uh, he was a farmer in Austria who ended up being executed because he wouldn't swear unconditional alliance, alliance, uh, uh, loyalty, unconditional loyalty to Adolf Hitler. And this is what he wrote in his diary. I would not exchange my small, dirty cell for a king's palace if I was required to give up even one small part of my faith. Disciples of Jesus must learn to perceive that suffering of their master is as unavoidable and, and, and to apprehend the religion of Jesus as the religion of the cross. In other words, if I say, oh yeah, my truest identity is this divine union with God, but I'll only allow the Spirit to control me if I get to keep my job, then I don't have that power anymore. It's not, it's, not, it's not that power plus my job, that power plus my 401k, that power plus my health, that power plus uh, the unity of our small group where we profoundly disagree and so I don't say anything anymore. It's not that. That's not it. Like, if I want to be in that stream, I, then sometimes I'm going to speak truth when I don't want to speak it because it's risky to do so. And I'll tell you, I've lived that and lost stuff because of it. 
Not major stuff, but stuff. And all of us need to ask the question, you know, what, I, what do I really want? Influence? Now, don't worry about it. Power, and not secular power, divine power that only comes from the fullness of the Spirit, that only comes from surrender. So, that's the first thing. So what happens then, these guys have this power, and there's an inquisition. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, all of whom were of the high priestly family. And when they'd set them in the midst, they said, by what power, by what name do you do this? So they'd seen this miracle, and Caiaphas, who was the brainchild of executing Jesus, by the way, by what power, what name do you do this? When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they'd been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they command the disciples to leave the room. And then they have kind of the closed door meeting, the religious leaders, who, by the way, are seminary educated, have big Bibles and prestigious jobs, right? And they go, what are we going to do? That a notable sign has been performed is evident to everyone. We can't deny it. But in order that it spread no further, let's warn these guys not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. That's the story right there. So here's the first observation. These guys don't dispute the evidence. They're not like, did that really happen? Here's the answer, yes. Peter knew it happened. The lame guy knew it happened. But also Caiaphas knew it happened. Every religious leader knew it happened. And not only did the miracle happen, but subsequent to the miracle, Peter preached a sermon that changed 5,000 lives. The indisputable evidence is that a man who couldn't walk his entire adult life is not just walking, but worshiping, singing praise to God. And the healer named Peter had responded by pointing people to Christ, and thousands believed, and Caiaphas knew it. This, is not a, this isn't an apologetics question, right? Like, did this really happen? No, no, they know with a capital K. We debate stuff. Did the resurrection happen? Did this healing happen? Do miracles happen? We debate. Fine, we can debate. These guys didn't debate. It happened. They know it happened. And yet the response is not, wow, Lazarus rose from the dead. Nobody can find Jesus' body. Pretty clear that he rose from the dead. Now this guy's been healed. 5,000 people are willing to walk away from Judaism as we know it and add Jesus to their existing faith. I wonder if there's something here. That's not what they ask. <laughs> not, you know, what is Jesus trying to teach us? They don't ask that. What do they ask? Not what does this mean. They ask, what does this mean for me? And that's a grand canyon of difference, friends. Because what does this mean for me is code for what does this mean for my livelihood, my standing in the community, my social media platform, my position in the domination, my human power, my 401k, my, 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 my comfort. When people in power face the invitation of life in Christ, they're often forced to either choose Christ and let him build their future or cling to the life they already have and miss what Christ wants to do through them and for them and it becomes a crossroads, right? My power or following Jesus. My, my influence are following Jesus. My social standing are following Jesus. That's what happened to Russell Moore. Like he, he couldn't, in good conscience, endorse a particular presidential candidate and was subsequently uh, uh, subject to hearings, right, uh, by the kind of executive council of, uh, of a denomination. And the hearings were so frequent and, and, and hours long and he'd come home exhausted at night. His finally, his teenage son said, Dad, uh, hey, just tell me, are you, what, are you having an affair? Because I know you go to these meetings and, you know, the denomination's investigating you. What's this about? And so the son said, well, it's hard to explain it, but, you know, you're 14, come to the meeting. It's not an affair, he said. Just come to the meeting. I'd be interested in your thoughts. So he goes to the next meeting. The son of this guy listens to all these accusations rolled at him. And afterwards, uh, Ru Russell says, so what'd you think of the meeting? The son says, well, dad, my faith in you is restored 150%. But I just have a simple question. Why do you want to hang out with these people? These people are disasters. Fearful, 
greedy, bitter, power hungry. Christians? And, and the son became, <laughs> like ultimately the impetus that God used to cause him to leave. Why do you want to hang on with these people? Good question, son. I could tell you 10 more stories like this because I travel and speak places. But the main point here, under the, op- uh, uh, under the op- observation of Inquisition engaged, is that the history of institutional religion is that once we get a little bit of power and prestige, hear me, it's incredibly tempting to make keeping the power the most important thing. And there are many, like, hidden motives behind that. Some who want to keep the power are threes on the Enneagram. You know what I mean by that? We love approval. Like, I don't want anyone leaving here scowling at me because I spoke something that they didn't like. So it's tempting to then shade things. Does that make sense? The threes in the room know exactly what I'm saying. Some are narcissists and, and cannot endure not having the biggest crowd, the most adulation. So are Epicureans. In other words, they just like the notoriety and season tickets people give them because they're doing a good thing. <laughs> All kinds of things. Some are just plain afraid. Because physiologically, getting kicked out of your tribe is physically painful. Cortisol, stress hormones, loss of sleep, tinnitus, as Russell Moore shares. But whatever is the base motive, there's a, here's a long history of people with power persecuting truth that's displayed and spoken from the margins. And the kind of power that persecutes the truth is, the, is the, sometimes the power of state, but sometimes it's the power of... Uh, of the, it's sec, sometimes it's secular power clothed in religion. Does that make sense? And if you look at the sermon that Stephen gave in Acts 7... He, you know, he's speaking to religious leaders again, and he says to them, Acts 7, 51, 52, you guys are stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart. You always visited the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. And then rhetorical question, which of, of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? In other words, you go back in the Old Testament, like who, who, who was mad at Jeremiah? People of God. Who was mad at Isaiah? People of God. Who was mad at Amos? People of God. Who was mad at Moses? People of God. They weren't persecuted by the state. They were persecuted by people with great big Bibles who sang Amazing Grace. Why? Because they had power and and to say yes to this lifestyle could cost my power. Man. Does that still go on? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you follow occupied Ukraine at all these days. But there have been two stories in the news that I watched extensively in the last two weeks about evangelical pastors being arrested. Some have already been killed in occupied Ukraine. And here's the deal. As long as you kiss the ring, you're fine. If a pastor gets up and says, Putin isn't invading us, he's restoring us to our truest identity as a nation. And this is a good thing, and we just need to surrender and let them have the space. Then you get your pulpit, and you get your pews, and you get your nice, you know, windows and heat and stained glass. You get it. You get to keep it all as long as you kiss the ring. But those who don't are whisked away, their building's appropriated, and it becomes a moral re-education center, and some of these pastors are dead. Yeah, it still happens today. So what's the point then? Well, the point is the last point. What's Peter going to do? And the answer is confidence, obedience declared. I I knew the last point would be the shortest one. There's a minute left. It will be the shortest one. (laughs) Peter and John answered and said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you judge. But we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. They threatened them further, let them go, found no way to punish them because all the people were there praising God. So they can't, but they want to kill them. Russell Moore recalls uh, being told by the executive council in his denomination, we can't fire you because too many people like you. But we can make your life hell. 
and we will. Now let's pray. Really? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's our world, friends. Well, Peter doesn't worry about it much. He says, you know, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you be the judge. We, we're going to keep speaking. It wasn't even a problem. Hans Jägerstadter said it this way, I have to do what I have to do. I just know I have to do it. My family doesn't understand. My friends criticize me. He was most criticized by church leaders, but I know it is the word planted in my heart for me at this time. I must follow Christ. Not Christ and keep my job. Not Christ and keep everybody happy. Not Christ plus anything. Christ, end of sentence, right? Like Christ, mic drop. I have that power. That's all I need. And the wind of the Spirit may grow my ministry or shrink my ministry or fire me and I am somewhere else. Doesn't matter. I follow Christ. I just want to say to you with everything in me, get there. Get to that level of courage. Get to that level of kind of unconditional, open-handed, shoot the moon commitment. Get there. Whatever it takes, get there because there is adventure. There is peace. There is life. Nowhere else. If it's Christ plus preserving the little kingdom I built, no, it won't work. We'll forever be anxious. Forever be fearful. How many have ever taken off in a plane and then the plane, you know, you get up there a little bit and the plane starts shaking? Has that ever happened to you? I hate that. Like, I'm not afraid of flying, but as soon as the plane starts shaking, because I'm not an engineer, I go, you know, I wonder, is it supposed to be shaking like this? Should we be worried? I don't know. Mm, you know, shaking. And then through the miracle of Boeing engineers who do almost everything right, you know, I mean it, they do. It stops shaking. And then you're like, okay, turn on the movies, open the book, enjoy the flight, take a nap. You don't worry anymore. But there's an inflection point where you're like, oh man, this is, this is anxiety. Look, the crossroads between secular power and divine power, that's an inflection point. And when you, when you come to that, and you will if you haven't already, the plane is shaking. Because you realize to say full yes, hard stop to Jesus plus nothing could cost you your, and then you fill in the blank. Your reputation, the little, you know, comfortable peace you have in your small group, a family relationship, it could be costly. To follow fully is costly. Yeah, it is. That's the way it is. On the far side of shaking, I can tell you, peace. <laughs> peace. You want peace? Follow fully. Let's pray. Jesus, the plane is totally shaking now. That's the world we live in. It's a world of family divisions, a world of political polarization, a world of name calling, a world of anger, a world of protests, a, a world of misrepresenting protests, a world of fear. And Father, we would just express to you collectively our desire as Bethany Community Church to not be seduced by the secular power and influence, the, the, the methodologies of this world. Our desire is to follow you fully. And as we find ourselves at inflection, in, at inflection points, Father, would you give us the grace to really sing that song, come Holy Spirit, heal me. Come Holy Spirit, free me from fear and shame and guilt. Come Holy Spirit, guide me. The plane's shaking. I gotta make a decision. Guide me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me. As we follow you, we thank you, Father, for all that awaits as we become healers, having received everything from you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's worship together.